Hello, my name is Kevin Hind, and this talk is entitled Corno Oligopoly, Convergence to Equilibrium. With such a tough title, it would be useful to provide some context before proceeding with some theory. Economists are interested in how organisations compete with each other in order to supply the goods and services that we consumers want. If we examine the real world, firms who supply goods that are technologically similar constitute an industry, and most industries can be described as oligopolistic. The car industry is oligopolistic, so is the computer and software industry, and the brewing industry, as well as the banking industry, and many, many more. These industries, of course, are heterogeneous, but they do have certain similar characteristics. We examine this in the next slide and go on to show how one model, that developed by Augustin Corno over 150 years ago, provides a useful vehicle for analysing oligopoly. So what exactly is oligopoly? Fellner described it as competition among the few. That is, it concerns situations where a few firms with similar technological characteristics compete against each other to supply goods and services to consumers. What Fellner is emphasising is the fact that these few firms have a degree of market power in the industry. They have some control over price because they supply a product or service that has some uniqueness, perhaps achieved by design or investment in technology and protected by a trademark or patent, or perhaps through a combination of human and physical capital that has become embedded and transferable within the organisation and is therefore extremely difficult to, for competitors to replicate. However, these firms don't have total market power because in raising prices, they will lose customers to competitors. But what is a few? Clearly more than one. The special name given to industries where there are two firms competing against each other is that of duopoly. There are a few industries that might be described as duopolistic. In the UK, for example, there are two suppliers of sugar, British Sugar and Tate and Lyle, each having around 95% of the market. In the UK brewing industry, there are five or six firms whose individual sales represent 10% or more of total industry sales. One firm has a market share of greater than 20%. Thus, this industry would be described as highly concentrated, a tight oligopoly. The implication being that this would be an industry where a small group of firms could exert more market power than industries where an individual firm's market shares have less impact on the industry overall. In tight oligopolies, firms tend to compete less on price and rather more on non-price variables, such as design and marketing. However, in loose oligopolies, where individual firms have less market power, price is more important. With some degree of market power, firms may have a deleterious effect on economic welfare, although the overall impact depends on the number of firms and the conduct they adopt. We will explore some of the possible welfare effects in a later session. But we begin with some basics and examine the model of Augustine Corner. Augustine Corno's model goes back to 1838, in which he described how two mineral water firms competed against each other. His model involves competition in quantities, and price is less explicit. In other words, he's looking at a non-price variable, sales vol volume. The biggest assumption made by Corno was that a firm will embrace another's output decisions in selecting its profit-maximising output. But they take that decision as fixed. That means the competitor, the competitor cannot alter it. In our model, the assumptions are very much as Corno's. We have two firms competing against each other with constant and identical marginal costs and facing the same market demand curve. Okay, in our model, we're going to look at two firms, firm one and firm two. So we have a duopoly. And we're going to show the situation, first of all, where what would be the outcome if firm one believes that firm two will supply the entire industry output. The answer is quite simple. If firm one believes that firm two will supply the industry 
output, then it will supply zero. This is illustrated in the diagram before you. There are two axes. On the vertical axis is price, although we haven't shown that because it's just closer at the diagram. And on the horizontal axis is quantity, Q. This, of course, is the most important variable in the corner model. For the moment, you should also notice the market demand curve, which is downward sloping from left to right, and the average cost curve, which is equal to marginal cost, because we assume that marginal cost is linear. So, what is the situation if firm one believes that firm two will supply the entire industry output? Well, if firm, if firm one believes that firm two will supply the entire industry output, then it is effectively believing that firm two is acting as an imperfect competition. It will set price equal to marginal cost. And we've illustrated that by showing Q2, the range of output from zero, up to the point where average cost and marginal cost intersect with the demand curve. This effectively means that firm one has no profitable output to supply. The residual demand left for it, that is the proportion of the demand curve under the average cost equals marginal cost line, and shown as a residual demand curve by drawing it back parallel, is actually below any profitable output. It cannot make a profit. So firm one will pro provide zero because it believes that firm two is providing the entire industry output. And what about the alternative? What if firm one believes that firm two will supply nothing? Well, if that is the case, then firm one believes it to become a monopoly supplier. Again, we can show that on a diagram. This is a traditional monopoly diagram, in effect. But what is happening here, we have the demand curve, and we have the marginal cost curve. And if firm two produces zero, it believes that if it wants to maximize its profit, then what it will do is it will set marginal cost equal to marginal revenue and supply Q1, which is a monopoly output. Now we're going to show a different diagram that of a reaction curve, which is maybe slightly different for some of you. Before you is a reaction curve. It shows two axes. Q1 and Q2, that is the quantities provided by Q1 and quantities provided by Q2. The reaction curve itself, of course, is de the depicted by the pink line, but it illustrates the output that firm one will produce given what it thinks firm two is producing. So remembering our previous diagrams, let's have a look at point A. At point A, if firm one believed that firm two was going to supply the entire market, it would be as if firm two was in perfect competition. Price would be equal to marginal cost. Firm one will supply zero, and firm two would supply A. The alternative, of course, was if firm one believed that firm two was going to supply zero, then it could produce as a monopolist. Prices would be greater than marginal cost. We were at point B. Of course, there'll be some points in between A and B, depending upon the assumptions that firm one is making about firm two's output. What we can say here as well is that profits will increase for firm one as it moves from A to B. By similar reasoning, if firm two makes the same conjectures, then we would get the following diagram. Here you can see both firm one's reaction curve and firm two's reaction curve. Firm one's reaction curve shows the profit maximizing output, Q1, is dependent upon what it believes firm two will produce. In a similar vein, firm two's reaction curve shows the profit maximizing output, 
that it will produce, given what it anticipates firm one will produce. Of course, these two lines intersect in our particular diagram, and that is known as the Corno equilibrium. So how do we achieve equilibrium? That is, how does equilibrium come about? Well, in fact, in the Corno model, there's an assumption that equilibrium occurs almost simultaneously. It's about rationality between the players. For example, if we're at point A, and we will be on firm one's reaction curve, firm one would believe it's a monopolist and should supply a monopoly output. But of course, firm two would think, well, if firm one is producing A, then we re on my reaction curve, that's equivalent to me being at point B. And of course, if firm one thinks that firm two is producing at B, then firm one is suggesting, well, I really should be at C. And so it goes on until we converge to an equilibrium where the two reaction curves intersect. There's some important dimensions to the Corno equilibrium, and we will discuss these in the next slide. So what are the implications of Corno? Well, very importantly, Corno actually gave us the opportunity to discuss non-price variables. And that, of course, is what most industries are about. They're not just about competition in terms of price, they're about competition in terms of other variables such as design, advertising and the like. Second and important implication from Corno is that you see welfare improvements over that of monopoly. And if you have more firms, then price will approach that of perfect competition. All this with a non-price competition model. A major critic of Augustin Corno was Joseph Bertrand, who wrote a review of Corno's model in 1883. Bertrand argued that a major problem with the Corno model is that it failed to make price explicit. Indeed, Bertrand himself showed that if firms compete on price, when goods are similar, at least to consumers, then a price war will develop so that price approaches marginal cost, just as it as it does in, in the perfect competition. That is, we have a perfectly competitive outcome, even though there are two firms competing against each other on price. However, if we manipulate the Bertrand model to examine differentiation, then we get an equilibrium closer in spirit to that of Corno. In sum, Corno remains an important model of understanding oligopoly today even though his paper was written over 160 years ago.